Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is Protecting Non-Human Primates Exploited as Pets, Sanctuaries, and Solutions. My name is Liz Quick Corral, and I am the Director of Development at World Animal Protection US. So today we're going to be discussing the primate pet trade in the US, meaning primates who are bought, sold, and kept as pets, and the suffering that these animals endure, as well as solutions. Joining us today, we have several panelists. We have Erica Fleury, who is the program director at the North American Primate Sanctuary Alliance. We have Amy Kerwin, who is the executive director of Primates Incorporated, and our very own Liz Cabrera Holtz, who is the wildlife campaign manager here at World Animal Protection. So before we get started, we also wanted to take a moment to introduce you to World Animal Protection. We are a global, animal welfare protection organization with offices in 13 different countries. We focus on protecting animals both in the wild and in farming. Our mission is to move the world to protect animals. And our vision is a world where animals live free from suffering. Now, before I hand it over to our speakers, we are thrilled to share a special message from Congressman Earl Blumenheyer, who is one of the champions of the Captive Primate Safety Act, a federal bill that would ban the private possession of primates. Congressman Blumenheyer and his team are working so hard to make this law a reality, and we're honored that he was able to take a few minutes to share this video with us. Greetings. I'm Congressman Earl Blumenauer from Portland, Oregon. Thank you to World Animal Protection for hosting today's webinar and for all of you attending to learn more about why keeping primates as pets is both hazardous and inhumane. There's absolutely no reason why these magnificent wild animals should be trapped inside homes away from their natural habitats. Beyond the harm to these incredible creatures, we've seen how this reckless practice puts families and communities at risk of physical attack and dangerous virus. In June of this year in Eastern Oregon, a woman was attacked by her 200-pound pet chimpanzee. The animal had to be shot. The woman and her mother sustained injuries to their torsos, arms, and legs. There are no winners in a situation like this. Two people are injured, first responders were put at risk, and a wild animal was killed merely for expressing normal behavior after a lifetime of captivity. Unfortunately, there are more of these examples of highly publicized primate attacks. The most horrific example was in 2009, where a woman in Stamford, Connecticut, was brutally attacked by a neighbor's pet chimpanzee, despite the fact that it's illegal to own primates as pets in Connecticut, and that this chimp had previously displayed aggressive behavior. The woman, Charla Nash, had her face and hands disfigured. In fact, her face was ripped off by the chimpanzee. She lost her sight due to a disease that was transmitted from the animal. Fortunately, Charla was one of the first people to receive a full face transplant and has since recovered, but she will bear the scars for a lifetime, and she continues to be affected by the incident. These stories and others show why it's best for people and primates to put federal state guards in place to end the private ownership of these animals. As co-chair of the Congressional Animal Protection Caucus in the House of Representatives, I've been working to do just that. In May, I reintroduced a bill called the Captive Primate Safety Act, which would ban the private ownership of primates and strengthen existing protections to prohibit interstate commerce and private ownership of monkeys, apes, and primates. In July, I testified before a crucial House committee to advance this legislation, and I will continue to work to build bipartisan consensus around this common sense bill. And each of you have an important role to play in that work. Start by learning more and raising awareness about this issue. I deeply appreciate your engagement, and I look forward to continuing to work alongside you to get this legislation across the finish line, not just to pass the House again, but to not let it die in the Senate. Democrats now control the Senate chamber. They are much more 
favorably oriented to animal welfare legislation, and we can get this passed this year. Thank you. So next I'm going to turn it over to Liz cabrera Holtz, who is our wildlife campaign manager. And she's gonna give us an overview of the primate pet trade. Over to you, Liz. Thanks, Liz. Uh, next slide, please. So the sad reality is that non-human primates are still being kept as pets, both across the world and the United States. But primates aren't domesticated animals. They're not like our cats and dogs. They're wild animals and they cannot thrive in human homes. Primates like monkeys and lemurs, they have complex social structures and they have to live in and be raised in their species appropriate um, families in order to develop normally and to behave normally. So when we attempt to keep them as pets, it results in severe psychological suffering and sometimes even physical suffering if the animal is not being fed a species appropriate diet um, or is being kept in a cage or a small enclosure most of the time. It's also dangerous as Congressman Blumenauer pointed out, um, these animals carry dangerous diseases like herpes B, tuberculosis and Ebola. And they're also um, can hurt humans. Uh, all primates can bite. And then some, of course, are quite physically powerful and can easily seriously injure or kill humans and have. Next slide, please. So just to give you a scope of the problem, I collected some recent news articles um, about pet primates in the United States. And it's important to note that except for this article in the middle about the musician Justin Bieber, all of these are just for, from a few months ago. These are from all around this summer. So we see at the top, there were lemurs uh, on the loose in Southern Florida in Broward County. And um, the article notes that lemurs are actually a fairly common pet in South Florida. It's legal to have lemurs in Florida and you uh, just need a permit from the state wildlife agency, which is not a high bar to meet. Then on the left, we have a story about a pet monkey in Reno, Nevada who escaped a second time. And this time um, the primate injured four people. And then at the bottom, we'll see a story about uh, a marmoset who was found in a Memphis clothing store just jumping around. And then in the middle, as I mentioned, this story about Justin Bieber in um, 2013 or 2015, he, Justin Bieber traveled with his pet monkey to Germany where the animal was confiscated because he didn't even bother to bring any paperwork that you'd need to uh, import a wild animal into another country. But still, in interviews years later, he keeps doubling down and saying he wants to get more pet monkeys and he doesn't see a problem with it. And then in the top right, we have a People Magazine article about a monkey who was being used to run a really popular TikTok, TikTok account. Um, he sadly passed away of what they said were natural causes. But this story about Justin Bieber in the People Magazine article, I wanted to point out because they demonstrate a few things. First, um, it's celebrities and social influencers, they're a major part of the problem um, because when they post photos and videos about their pet primates, it tells people that one, it's okay to have a pet primate, it's normal, um, it's not a cruelty issue. And two, you can actually like, you know, make money and get famous off of it. And the People Magazine article was particularly frustrating because you'd read it and you'd think it was an article about like a cat. It didn't talk about any of the problems, any of the safety issues. It didn't interview people like Erica or Amy, experts who you'll hear from next. Um, again, you'd read this article and you'd think maybe I could have a pet monkey. Uh, it didn't list any of the problems associated with the pet primate trade or the, um, the ways that this animal, Georgie Boy, uh, was denied his, you know, a, a natural life in the wild. Next slide, please. But in more positive news, um, there has been steps forward. In 1975, the CDC banned the importation of primates except for scientific, educational, or exhibition purposes, so not pets. And in 2003, there were only nine states that restricted or banned private possession. And today, 31 states restrict or ban possession, meaning um, some states have total bans on the keeping of primates as pets and other states only restrict certain species. Next slide. 
So of course, with these loopholes and these gaps, um, the problem persists. Primates are still being bred and sold by licensed and unlicensed breeders in the United States. We have 19 states with no restrictions. And then some of these other states, you know, only certain species are banned when really all of them need to be banned. And conservative estimates suggest um, there are roughly 15,000 primates being kept as pets, but there's no database. There's a lot of animals being kept illegally. So this is really just a guess and the number could be much, much higher. Next slide. So basically this is a national problem that needs a national solution. The patchwork of inconsistent state, local, and federal laws and regulations aren't doing enough to protect either the animals in these homes um, or humans. So that's where the Captive Primate Safety Act comes in. Next slide. So as uh, Congressman Blumenauer noted, the Captive Primate Safety Act amends the Lacey Act, which is our country's oldest wildlife law. It was passed in 1900 to address wildlife trafficking. And it would amend the Lacey Act to ban the private possession of non-human primates. And it would also prohibit interstate commerce, mostly meaning purchasing and um, selling non-human primates. So a breeder in Texas couldn't breed a monkey to, to be used as a pet and then sell it to me in Maryland uh, to keep that monkey as a pet. So the bill, the Captive Primate Safety Act was introduced by US Representatives Earl Blumenauer in Oregon, Brian Fitzpatrick in Pennsylvania. And then on the Senate side, <coughs> we have uh, Senator Richard Blumenthal in Connecticut. Next slide. But we need your help to make this bill law. So one way you can do that is by contacting your legislators. We've made it really easy for you. Um, you can just go to our website, worldanimalprotection.us. At the top of the screen, you'll see um, a way to go to the Captive Primate Safety Act, fill out a little information, and emails will be automatically sent to your legislators. Then if you're willing to take the next step, follow up with a phone call. Um, it'll be really short and painless. You just say your name, you're a constituent, and you'd like your legislator to be a co-sponsor, and they won't ask you questions. <laughs> Finally, don't like, comment, or watch videos and posts that feature wild animals being kept as pets. And this goes beyond primates, um, big cats, turtles, um, any wild animal you can think of. They're being exploited on these social media accounts. And when we watch them, it rewards the creator. Um, the algorithm will get, they'll get more views. Um, they can even make money. Um, so it's best to just keep them off your feed and not engage at all. Uh, so I hope you'll, you'll find the time to take one of those actions. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. I'll hand it back to Liz. Thank you so much, Liz. So our next speaker today is Erica Fleury. Erica is an author and the program director of the North American Primate Sanctuary Alliance, which works to unite the primate sanctuary community, build capacity to provide sanctuary for captive primates, and advocate to eliminate primate exploitation. In addition to NAFSA's general work, she is also currently leading the Chimpanzees in Need emergency rescue effort. So Erica, over to you. Thank you, Liz. Next slide, thank you. Um, I am so happy to hear the advice and even the concerns shared by Congressman Blumenauer and Liz already. Um, they are really doing a great job of explaining the concerns when it comes to primates as pets. So I'm here today on behalf of the North American Primate Sanctuary Alliance, or NAPSA, to talk to you about the impact of primates in the pet trade and beyond the individual concerns for the animals, which are huge and massive and very concerning, um, how that impacts the sanctuary community as a whole. Next slide, please. So NAPSA is a coalition of 10 of the leading primate sanctuaries on the continent. They care for over 800 rescued and retired primates, including 700 chimpanzees, but also many monkeys, who all have come from either biomedical research, the entertainment industry, or the pet trade. Um, NAPSA's mission is to unite the primate sanctuary community, build capacity to provide homes for as many of these animals as possible, 
and advocate to eliminate exploitation. Um, these are our big projects and we have a lot of work ahead of us and we've of course made some great progress. Um, our members are based all over the country as well as Canada and I am based in Los Angeles. Next slide. So one of the concerns when it comes to sanctuaries is that there is no law about who can call themselves a sanctuary. This can make it very confusing for members of the general public who might have a real desire to help primates, but may not understand that liking that video of a chimpanzee wearing clothes or a monkey climbing on someone's shoulder, they may not realize that that's harmful and they may not know how to distinguish a true reputable sanctuary from those other types of facilities that do unfortunately exploit primates. So NAPSA is, has a very adv active advocacy program to educate the public and to provide resources for anyone wanting to learn more. So if you go to our website, which is primatesanctuaries.org, there's an advocacy section. And one of the documents we offer is a position statement on how to identify a true sanctuary. So this is an example on the screen here of some of the information that we share. I won't read through all the bullets right now, but, but some of the main concerns and, and ways to identify a true sanctuary is that they are a nonprofit organization. They, are, um, they do not breed, exploit, um, trade in animals, remove them for any purpose, including education. Um, a true sanctuary keeps the animals as the, the only priority, right? So they only do what is in the very best interest of that individual animal. And it's important to recognize too that when primates come to sanctuaries, they come from you know, a variety of backgrounds and can have many different experiences that then impact the care that they need. Sanctuary care is individualized and um, based on giving the animals choice in how to spend their days, um, the freedoms to be social if they want or be alone if they want, eat if they want or not, sleep when they want and where they want. And it's really about choice. If you think about you know, when you retire one day, what you, what you want your days to be like, that's what these animals deserve and what they get at a true sanctuary. Um, so NAPSA does not accredit its members. We leave that up to the organizations who specialize in that very objectively. Um, so in order to be a member of NAPSA, a sanctuary has to meet all, you know, um, they have to be licensed by the USDA and, and through the state if necessary, but also have accreditation from the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. Next slide. One topic that we are very vocal on um, is of course the use of primates in the pet trade. Now, the, Liz has already touched on a number of reasons why this is such a problem. Um, what I see in my position at NAPSA is that the more that primates are used in the pet trade, um, the more they are then needing homes in sanctuaries. And so I did a, a quick glance at the number of placement requests that I received in the last 12 months. And I've, per just me at NAPSA, I've received requests to house 87 primates in the last 12 months. Um, that is a number on the rise. That is more than years before. Um, and that is something I anticipate to grow. Now, unfortunately, we have not been able to house all those animals. Primate sanctuaries are more in demand than ever before. Um, not only from the pet trade, but also because primates are being phased out in some ways of entertainment and some species out of laboratory research, although that is growing for other species, unfortunately. But at the bottom of the screen here, you can see even more headlines about um, primates in the pet trade. And these are ones that NAPSA has been specifically involved in or interviewed about. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of them a little bit further on in this presentation. Um, but it's a huge concern and we, we absolutely get more requests for placement from the states that restrict primate ownership the least. So those states that do not have any bans or don't have a full ban on private ownership of primates, that's where I get a lot of phone calls from. You know, I get a lot from North Carolina and Florida. Um, when primates are bred for the pet trade, oftentimes the owners or the, the customers, the people that buy the animal or, you know, quote, adopt the animal, um, they are not fully educated on what that animal needs. And what that results in are people that then become overwhelmed by their pet. 
um, and, and can't meet their needs over time and need to give them up or choose to or have them you know, taken from them for a variety of reasons. So we'll talk more about that in a moment. Next slide, please. Another advocacy document that we have on our website is a position statement on the private ownership of primates. NAPSA and its sanctuaries are universally opposed to the captive, uh, to the practice of keeping primates in human homes. There is no benefit to it. It is never in the best interest of the animal or the owner. Okay, the concerns relate to the humans and the animals. Um, Liz has already mentioned this. They are not domesticated animals. They will never be. They will bite. We say that primate uh, bites from a primate or attacks are, are inevitable. They should be expected. Um, the concerns start right at birth when primates are bred for the pet trade. They are removed from their mothers almost immediately at birth or very soon after in order to facilitate quicker breeding and also the tractability of that individual animal. Um, primates are cute when they're little, they're easy to sell and people want them when they're babies. So that denies the animal the natural maternal bonding and long-term relationship that they are meant to have in the wild and, and should have. When they're denied that, they develop aberrant behaviors. They develop psychological trauma. Um, and often in the pet trade, they are you know, never housed with other primates. So that lack of social opportunities, um, it results in a lack of mental stimulation, physical stimulation because they're not exercised the way they would in the wild. Um, and then that turns into physical suffering. So we see obsessions, compulsions, self-harming is very frequent, um, even self-amputation. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredibly sad and, and horrific to see what happens to primates when they're living in human homes. Um, oftentimes, you know, the lucky ones who arrive at a sanctuary um, the sanctuaries do the best they can to help those animals and, and, and give them what they need so that maybe some of those harmful self-harming behaviors can be stopped, but many times they persist throughout the lifetime of that animal. Um, some other concerns in the pet trade are, of course, the transfer of zoonotic diseases from pet to human and vice versa, but even tooth removal. So this is not something a lot of people know, but when primates are in the pet trade, um, oftentimes their teeth are surgically removed so that when they inevitably bite, they won't harm humans as much. Um, this is you know, inhumane in and of itself, but it also means that the animal can then not eat typical foods throughout its entire lifetime. And veterinary care can be impossible if not you know, and challenging to find um, in certain parts of the country. So a lot of times the pets that come to NAPSA member sanctuaries have either never been seen by a vet or have been seen very infrequently and have um, undiagnosed problems. So I can't stress enough, even in sanctuaries, these animals continue to suffer. Um, this is avoidable. If laws like the Captive Primate Safety Act are passed, we can avoid a lot of these problems and lessen the strain on sanctuaries who of course then have to pick up the pieces and right now don't have the financial resources or ability to meet the needs of all the animals that need help. Next slide. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. Um, this is Jeter. Jeter is a male chimpanzee who is currently housed at the wildlife way station. That is a, it was an unaccredited refuge in outside of Los Angeles that unexpectedly shut its doors in 2019 because they were unable to continue caring for their animals, quite frankly. Um, they were overwhelmed and had to throw up their hands and ask for help. So although they were not a NAPSA member sanctuary, um, we were approached to help solve this problem. At the time of its closure, there were 480 animals on site um, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife stepped in to oversee everything and, and miraculously succeeded in rehoming almost all the animals, but there were 42 chimpanzees at the time. And sanctuaries, as I have mentioned, were um, you know, very high in demand and quite frankly, didn't have space for any chimpanzees at that time. Even zoos didn't have space. So NAPSA was approached to help solve this problem. And we have started the Chimpanzees in Need fundraiser you can access that at chimpsinneed.org. And we are working with a large collaborative group 
um, including the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and fundraising experts to raise the funds so that accredited sanctuaries can responsibly grow to take in these chimpanzees. Um, they will not have to shut their doors unexpectedly like this place did. Um, and, and so Jeter here was a former pet chimpanzee who arrived at the wildlife way station a few years ago. Um, he had never been housed with other chimps. He knew nothing about being a chimpanzee. And so at the way station, he was unable to socialize with other chimps, which is heartbreaking, right? Here's the first chance he's had to be with other chimps. And um, he didn't know how to communicate. He didn't know how to be around them appropriately. And so they would pick on him. Um, he was getting bullied and injured. And so he had to be removed from all the groups that they tried to match him with. And he's been by himself. Now we have a solution for Jeter. We are working really hard to rehome him. It may be as early as the end of this year if enough funds come in so you can learn more about this campaign and all the chimps like Jeter that are desperately awaiting rescue at chimpsinneed.org. But you know, again, if the pet trade didn't exist, Jeter wouldn't have been born into it and he wouldn't be stuck right now. Next slide. This is Buck, another chimpanzee. Um, Senate, Senator or Congressman Blumenauer mentioned him already. Um, this is the chimpanzee in Oregon who was living in a human home for 17 years, a big male chimp. I mean, you can see him right there. Uh, like Jeter, as far as I know, he had no experience living with other chimps. This was his life. Um, Napsa and other primate experts had reached out to his owner many times in the past to offer help and offer placement for Buck, knowing that attacks are to be expected. And his owner did not agree with us and um, wanted to keep Buck in her home. And sure enough, a few months ago, the inevitable occurred and Buck attacked. Uh, I know he attacked her daughter um, pretty seriously. And, you know, police came and shot and killed him. And the, the frustration, I, I can't, it's hard to describe that, you know, the frustration that we were not able to help Buck. And again, Buck was here because he was bred for the pet trade. Um, this is, was completely avoidable, and we don't want to see more primate suffering like Jeter, like Buck, and like the hundreds of thousands of monkeys that are living in human homes right now. Next slide. So, you know, there's a lot more we could talk about. You're going to hear some specifics from my colleague Amy Kerwin next. But here on the screen are a few of the other sanctuary directors that work with me at, uh, at NAPSA. Um, and you can find information on how to contact us here. So if you have any questions about anything I've talked about, I'd love to hear from you. And uh, maybe we'll have some questions pop up later in this, in this presentation. So thank you for your interest in helping primates, ending their use in the pet trade and supporting the Captive Primate Safety Act, which cannot come soon enough. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erica. So our last speaker today is Amy Kerwin. Eamon Kerwin discovered the urgent need to help monkeys while working in a laboratory with 97 Reese's monkeys during college, prompting her to form the nonprofit Primates Incorporated in 2004. Their mission is to improve the quality of life for monkeys who have been retired from research facilities, private ownerships, and the entertainment industry by providing them with an indoor and outdoor sanctuary near Westfield, Wisconsin. So over to you, Amy. Hi everyone, thanks so much for having me here today to speak to you about the Primates Incorporated Sanctuary and how we're helping monkeys from both the pet trade and laboratories. Um, I really appreciate your increasing awareness and making change for the primates as so many of them are in need of help. Next slide, please. So after all the years of effort, um, in developing the sanctuary and taking notes from others and really learning about the need to help monkeys. Uh, we formed Primates Incorporated and we're now home to nine sanctuary residents. So I just wanted to introduce you to the ones first from the pet trade and discuss challenges in rehabilitating them and overcoming the challenges at the end here before we hand it back. Maddie and Noah, we were fortunate enough actually that they were um, housed together in the pet trade. Um, unfortunately though, the owners wanted to see 
Maddie get a buddy and they bought Noah, but then of course they're complete handfuls and the monkeys had to be housed in their outdoor enclosure in Tennessee. And so just in the nick of time, we helped rescue them from their outdoor enclosure last um, December, before, right before the ice storm. And it really takes months of planning and a lot of money and preparation to care for monkeys. And so we are just glad to see them helped and them being with each other and socialized. And then we've got Jojo and Bella, they're vervet monkeys and they found each other at the sanctuary. We were so glad to see affiliation so strongly between the two of them that we were able to socialize them just within a day. Um, but Bella is 17 years old from the pet trade and her owners really loved her and wanted to see her find sanctuary. And she of course was becoming too much of a handful and then Jojo was confiscated from the pet trade in Nebraska and we were able to take him in so we're glad that they found each other but pet monkeys are very difficult to socialize and have the many abnormal behaviors and so yes that's good that they have each other but then the saddest story is Junior in the middle there um, after 16 years he came to us from the pet trade. Um, a farm helped him out, but they wanted to see Junior meet other monkeys. And he actually hadn't met any other monkeys in 16 years. And so he really doesn't have a display any typical monkey behaviors. He's giving mixed signals to the other monkeys. And so for monkeys like Junior, it can take months or years to socialize or we may find out that, um, you know, he prefer not to be with another monkey, but we're showing some affiliation now that he's taking notes from the other monkeys and getting plenty of enrichment. Um, and one of the keys for socializing macaques is to assess their behavior prior. You want to have a dominant and submissive relationship form prior to socializing because it's so difficult to socialize them that they could actually kill each other if you put two dominant macaques together. So not only does it require a lot of time, expense, and care, but also, you know, professional care staff to really um, socialize these animals. Next slide, please. And so these are the monkeys retired from laboratories. And why I knew that a sanctuary was needed way back when so much was that I was hearing that the monkeys from the pet trade were actually filling up the sanctuaries, leaving less room for monkeys from laboratories to retire. And still today in breeding facilities and laboratories nationwide, we have approximately 108,000 monkeys living in laboratories and more researchers are wanting to get back to them. And these are all rhesus monkeys. Um, and years ago in the laboratory, I wanted to gain experience with primates in college. And so that's why I wound up working there in Wisconsin. And then discovering the 97 rhesus monkeys and their amazing personalities and individual differences and how smart they were, um, they inspired me to do more for them. So I created the sanctuary because I was hearing stories of how um, other sanctuaries had to turn away laboratories looking to retire their monkeys, even though my laboratory was actually even against primate retirement on any level. And so to hear that actually laboratories are being turned away because of pet monkeys um, filling up sanctuaries and capacity and funding issues was um, tough to hear. Next slide, please. Other challenges in helping monkeys from the pet trade are often veterinarians um, don't approve of you know, having exotic animals as pets. And so they're refusing to help out. And now that helps with creating change, the, the people are unfortunate enough to get sucked into buying them as babies because they maybe saw the idea on social media 
Well, then as a monkey grows, they challenge the dominance. And then that can take a, a toll on the human owner. And then over the years, if they can't find a veterinarian, then you know some monkeys could go years without veterinary care. And at the sanctuary, we require physicals to be done prior and work with the pet monkey owners who are willing to um, sign over ownership, et cetera. And then the bottom line is, um, you know, chimps still need help and the thousands of monkeys need help. Um, in the laboratory, I realized how many of them need retirement and how much lack of space there is out there. And so I really just can't, um, you know, emphasize enough how much um, foundations and corporations and the public need to be involved because these monkeys can live 35 to 40 years old. Next slide, please. And then just really discouraging um, having monkeys in the pet trade is just so important. Um, I can't think of enough ways to discourage it. I've heard of many sad pet monkey stories. Um, Polly Schultz from another sanctuary wrote a book called Monkeys Don't Wear Diapers and people will get scared of them and put them in crates. Um, and then I just, you know, want to tell people who express interest, you know, do you want to be a monkey exploiter or do you want to be a monkey helper? You know, do you want to donate to a nonprofit cause that's helping monkeys or do you want to support an industry of backyard breeders and weaning monkeys, you know, prematurely from their mothers? Um, so really to get out there and discourage pet monkey ownership and to call it out and whenever you see it, and also the sanctuary is out there on social media um, showing you know, species typical behavior and um, discouraging monkeys in the pet trade and um, encouraging the retirement of, retirement of monkeys from laboratories. So that the combined effort of those, we really wanna set precedent as a sanctuary and see other sanctuaries built in every state because the need to help primates is so great. So if you could discourage other people from getting primates as we work on this legislation, um, that will really help as well. And then, We've got to all work together to, um, you know, help sanctuaries and strengthen the sanctuary community and helping all, all primates. And one thing I'd like to talk to you about, too, is how um, we provide free education in our volunteer program to, you know, people who are interested in wanting to learn about primate behavior and care. And so a component of our funding is for free education. And then that way people can learn about primates without um, necessarily having to work in a lab for vet school. And um, they can come and work at the sanctuaries to be a, a monkey helper rather than an exploiter. And then um, for our rehabilitation program, the volunteers are trained to assess primate behavior and to be able to socialize the monkeys successfully. Uh, we do assess that behavior ahead of time and we're proud to say that all the monkey residents at the sanctuaries live in pairs. And then we have Junior that we're still very much assessing his behavior, giving him extra enrichment and plenty of um, extra fruit as that is his favorite and just making sure that he's showing those species uh, typical behaviors and he's often caught foraging and grooming himself and then also giving lip smacks to the other monkeys. So there's hope for Junior and there's hope for all the other primates thanks to all the efforts of great humans out there like you. So um, I'll be happy to field questions in a little bit that concludes my portion, thank you.
Thank you so much to all of our presenters. And so now we have a chance to ask uh, some of our speakers some questions. So feel free to enter any questions that you have into the chat box and we'll go ahead and get started. And I think just to kick us off as well, while folks are getting their questions into the chat box, uh, Amy and Erica, I would be really interested in learning more about how you first got involved in this work. <laughs> Amy, do you want to start? Oh, sure. Well, it all started back in college when I um, wound up working at that laboratory for five years. And then just over time, really learning um, about the rhesus monkey behavior and working to improve their welfare in the laboratory. And then once I realized that um, I couldn't make any more improvements for the monkeys and that my management won't retire the monkeys, um, I decided to resign and um, actually instead of going to veterinary school, which is why I wound up working in the lab in the first place, I went to business school so that I could bring everyone together to overcome the challenges and, um, you know, take pride in, in connecting researchers who want to retire the monkeys from their lab with researchers um, who are already doing it so that um, we can maximize primary retirement. So I've made it kind of my life's work to give back to monkeys after witnessing all of that. So thank you. Sort of like Amy, I actually started in college too, but on a different track. Um, I discovered a primatology course when I was right about to graduate and I had time in my schedule to fit it in and took it and loved it and couldn't get enough. And of course, then I graduated and I, I didn't have plans to continue with school at that time, but I kept reading every single book I could find. Um, it started about chimpanzees and the sign language studies that had gone on because I was an English major and I just was fascinated by the thought that you could communicate with another species like this. Um, then the more I learned about it, the more I realized, you know, this maybe wasn't so great for the chimps. It's great. It might be cool for us, but not so much for them. And I got much more involved in the ethics of, of you know, primate exploitation and how they're used in this country. Um, that translated into a, an internship with a sanctuary called the Primate Rescue Center in Kentucky. And, um, and then I wrote my book, Monkey Business, A History of Non-Human Primate Rights, when I realized there was no one volume that encapsulated everything going on in the history of primate rights and protectionism in this country. Um, so I wanted to document it. So I did. And now, you know, I'm fortunate enough to work with everyone here to make continued changes. I think I knew back then that there was a lot that had happened and this was such a growing movement. And so much has happened since that book came out in 2013 that it's, it's really heartening that it's almost obsolete at this point. And I love that. That's the whole goal. <laughs> so I think sanctuaries always say that they're working. They're one of the only industries that works to put itself out of business. And um, I know Amy would be so thrilled if she didn't need to have her sanctuary anymore, right? And that's sort of what, what all these sanctuary founders and directors think as well. So um, we're all working together to make that happen. That's great. Thank you both for sharing that. Our next question is directed to Liz and it's about other wild animal bills that Congress may be working on and how folks can get involved in supporting those. Oh, Liz, it looks like we do have a note that it doesn't look like you're muted though, but <laughs> that some folks can't hear you. No, I think while, while you sort out some technical uh, difficulties, we'll go over to Amy uh, and people are wondering what is the best part about running a primate sanctuary? <laughs> Uh, 
Well, I, I love seeing the uh, monkeys, you know, being able to go outside and explore multiple environments. Um, and especially after seeing in them in the <clears throat> minimum guidelines are approximately three feet in every direction for a monkey in a laboratory, similar to a human, you know, living in a closet. And so, um, you know, being a part of NAPSA and bringing the, the humans together to help the primates, I think it's been the most rewarding part, but then also to be given a challenge and to overcome it, like from interviewing other sanctuaries or um, zoos about, for example, being able to provide natural vegetation to the primates. And we actually um, provide them with like thyme and oregano in addition to um, natural grasses, rye and clover. And then they really pick and eat that grass, but then they really don't touch the thyme and oregano. So you can really give them a green environment um, with, you know, non-toxic plants, like it can be done. Um, and I love seeing them forage through those environments and then assessing their uh, natural behaviors and ensuring that they are showing more natural behaviors like they would in the wild, like foraging and traveling and seeing the reduction in those abnormal behaviors from um, living in the species in adequate environments. So seeing them become monkeys over time has been the most rewarding. Great, I love that. Just watching them become monkeys and exhibiting all those natural behaviors, you know, that we love to see. So Erica, our next question is for you. And it's, um, you know, how optimistic are you that we may see the end of pet primates in our lifetime? I actually, I mean, I'm an, I'm an, an optimist at heart <laughs> to begin with. So I'll preface it by saying that, but I really am optimistic. I think when we see the progress that's been made in other fields of primate um, protectionism, such as the end of chimpanzee research, um, I know that is something that chimpanzee advocates always wanted and worked towards, but um, we're happy to see how quickly it came about. Let's put it that way. Um, so I would think that with the facts as they are about the complete lack of benefits of keeping primates in the pet trade um, and all the benefits of ending it. Even, you know, for those people that are more concerned with human um, suffering or how this impacts humans, there's all these reasons, right, that, that are human centric about why primates shouldn't be in the pet trade. And then for those that are more concerned with the animals, there's all these reasons why it's best for the animals to end this practice. So um, I do think this is something we can absolutely um, get in place um, I think, you know, then the question becomes, where do the animals in the pet trade go? But the first step, of course, is just ending the breeding, ending that constant stream out into the world that sanctuaries like Amy's then have to try to clean up. And it's, and it's impossible for a nonprofit organization to grow fast enough and provide care to all the animals that need it, all, all these pets. It's, it's just overwhelming. And so we need to put an end to the cause of it all. And that's the pet trade. So, you know, when I hear when I hear Congressman Blumenauer and I hear those of you on this call and I see the people attending, it gives me even more hope um, because there's a lot of humans dedicated to this and, and that's what's needed and that's what will make it happen. Yeah, we had a couple of questions in here about folks wanting to support the Captive Primate Safety Act as a whole and, and ways to take action. So as a reminder, you can head over to our website on worldanimalprotection.us and you'll be able to use sort of our captive primate safety section to send a letter to your uh, congressman or woman to ask them to support the bill and co-sponsor it. Uh, we'll also be sending out instructions on how to support um, in a follow-up email. So I know we had a couple of comments of folks who sort of missed the first half or wanting to sort of take that action that's coming soon. Uh, we have another uh, great question. I think really Amy and Erica, you know, both, um, how can we help support, you know, good sanctuaries and sanctuaries like the ones that are in NAPSA and Amy like yours, um, you know, what are sort of the best way to provide resources to those who are, who are helping the problem? I think the first step is to familiarize yourself with who the good trustworthy places are. 
Um, you can start by looking at NAPS's website at that document about how to identify a true sanctuary. Um, and if you are on social media or elsewhere, if you are following any of those places that don't meet those guidelines, I urge you to reconsider. Um, it, there really is a direct link between watching those videos, those, you know, those harmful memes, all that stuff that exploits animals. Um, remove yourself from it and don't be a part of the problem. Um, and then there are good sanctuaries scattered all throughout the country. Um, I know each of them have, you know, it's as simple as donating money or you, a lot of them have volunteer programs in non-COVID times. I think some of them are starting to reopen. Um, they offer public events once in a while that are safe for the animals. And they often have wish lists too of items that you can send. It, it might be cleaning supplies, it might be blankets for the monkeys, but those are real needs that directly go to the animals um, and that are always you know, asked for. So um, there are lots of ways. You can also always contact NAPSA if you think that you have a skill that might be helpful or if you're interested in a, in a position at a sanctuary, there's, there's many options for how to support the right places. Yeah, I don't know if I missed anything from your perspective. <laughs> it was like all good. <laughs> Sign everyone up for that. <laughs> no, it, it takes um, a village, right? Yeah, <laughs> it really does uh, to see this sort of change that we want to see. Um, I think we have time for just one more question, and I think it's uh, you know for whoever wants to sort of take it. But I'm sure many of the folks on this call and and sort of indicated by this question, you know, it can be daunting sometimes to sort of understand and grasp uh, the severity of the problems, you know, seeing sort of the abuse, hearing directly from you all about some of the, the stories of how sort of the monkeys are rescued and some of the trauma they still endure. So what do you all do as sort of animal advocates, you know, to take care of yourself and, and stay optimistic or, or stay in the fight? Um, any tips maybe for folks who are listening in around that? That's such a great question. And it's so pervasive in this community, right, of animal protection. Um, compassion fatigue is a real problem. NAPSA provides resources to its members and the community about how to provide self-care and keep keep going um, in the face of like constant trauma and constant suffering um, and, and feeling like, gosh, the problems are just, just so overwhelming. But I think focusing on progress that's been done and networking with the other human beings who are decent and you know productive and helping provide the solution is, is huge. Um, so NAPSA normally hosts a workshop conference every two years that is public, um, you know, publicly accessible. Um, and of course, with COVID, we had to stop right now, but we will be resuming that when it's safe to do so. But I know those types of functions, even when they're virtual, um, are really inspiring because you get to see everyone for who they are. Um, and we can laugh and commiserate and you end up feeling renewed, even if, you know, all we have is a work plan in place, it's something. And, um, you know, we're all in this together and, and it requires grace knowing that everyone is always going through something, particularly after the last, you know, year and a half or two years. Yeah, and I like to um, focus on common ground whenever um, challenges come our way to communicate um, with everyone. And then just knowing all the problems, you know, been working or volunteering on this, you know, pretty much every day since I knew about it. Um, and so I have a long list of to do items, but to just do what I can. And if I'm not in the mood to work on this big daunting task, well, then I can just check off this other task. And then um, by enlisting the support and increasing awareness and delegating out is is key and um, also important to encourage um, employee input and make sure that your employees are doing well um, because of this compassion fatigue. And, um, you know, they see, it's really great to see them invested in the organization and that's, that's very rewarding. So just to like keep at it and whatever you're doing. Yeah, I know something else that helps if you're able, you know, if you're a sanctuary employee or volunteer, or if you have the ability to visit on one of the rare donor days where they are open to the public, um, seeing the individual animals thriving, 
um, and living in peace at these facilities is incredibly heartwarming and inspiring. Um, and if you're not able to do that, I know so many of them have really great social media presences with photos and videos and blogs that um, truly like make me laugh and giggle and I have to show my friends because these animals are just so amazing. Um, and you learn a lot about resilience of the animals and um, you, there's a lot that humans can learn about overcoming trauma as well. So um, if, if they can do it, we can keep going. Very well said. Thank you so much for your input on that really important topic uh, to both of you, Erica and Amy. Um, so unfortunately, we are just about at time. Uh, I could ask questions all day for you two, um, but we do need to wrap up. And we just want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, on this screen, you'll just see several ways that you can help protect wild animals, including supporting the Captive Primate Safety Act, which we touched on. Uh, taking our wildlife, not pets pledge, and then also a QR code to become a world animal protection supporter. But I just want to thank everyone again for your time and a special thanks to all of our presenters today uh, on talking about this important and valuable issue. So yeah, I hope everyone has a wonderful evening ahead. Thank you. Thank you.